Good morning. Good morning, Wisconsin Annual Conference. God is good. And all the time. Please join us for a devotion. Good morning, my beautiful people. As Bishop always says. My name is Erumakono Arthur Zito, the pastor from the Milwaukee African Ministry. I will lead today's devotion. This is the day that the Lord has made. Greetings to you all, my brothers and sisters, in the name of the Christ. We gather this new day, lift songs of joyful praise to invite the spirit of holy anointing to yield with openness to the living word. May the spirit fall upon us today. Amen. Let us sing together. Open, O song of ages, open, O wisdom of sages, open your eternal life, put it out, put it out. Open, O wind of animation, open, O wheel of determination, open the eternal fountain, pour it out, pour it out. Let us sing together, okay? <laughs> Open, O breath of elation, open, O mind of inspiration, open no your eternal fountain. fountain, pour it out, O oh, pour it out. First reading comes from the book of Psalms, chapter 16, verse 11. The Bible says, You show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures for every more.
second reading comes from the book of Psalm, <clears throat> chapter 133, verse 3. Like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion, the Lord ordains his blessing, <clears throat> life for evermore. pray for blessing. <clears throat> Spirit, bless your people. Let this be the day of new beginning. Let this be the day of new inspired learning. Let this be the day of heartfelt yelling. Spirit, bless your people, we pray. Let this be the day. The day. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask you to praise God with us. This is the day. seated. Good morning. Good morning. It is a, again a beautiful day. It is a joyful day. Beautiful people, you are blessed. I am blessed. We are all blessed. Would you say amen? I am inviting Reverend Tom White uh, to microphone three and offered our opening prayer this moment. So let us say pray together. Lord, we give you thanks for this time that we can spend together in fellowship and renewing our acquaintances that we have not renewed for quite a while. We thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit as we go about the deliberations of this conference. We pray that as we have gathered here today, and we give you thanks for the rest of the night, that we will be refreshed and that we will be ready to do the work you have in mind for us. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Tom. And actually, uh, I am 
especially uh, thankful to Reverend Tom White because uh, many pastors I've been sent to North Fandalek area as a bishop. He always uh, arms around them and nurture. You've been done many great mentoring to many clergy, young clergy especially. So recognize your uh, beauty and your amazing leadership. Thank you this morning that I honor you. Many uh, retired clergy among our uh, conference, they are participating, and I especially thanking them and their hard work behind. And it is uh, joyful to working uh, with our retired clergy community. Okay, Barb, and we are a special moment to introduce our Bible study leaders. And I've been privileged to know the Dr. Roger Nam from Candler Group Theology at the Emory. And let us invite, yes. All right. You should have done the introduction. No, no, know him you do that, please. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to read for you the official introduction for Dr. Roger S. Nam who joined Candler School of Theology in 2020 after serving as Dean and Professor of Biblical Studies at Portland Seminary at George Fox University in Oregon. Before entering academia, Nam was a financial analyst in the Silicon Valley from 1997 to 2000 and a pastor in Seoul, Korea from 1994 to 1996. Nam is the author of Portrayals of Economic Exchange in the Book of Kings, the, the Theology of the Books of Ezra and Nehemiah, and a forthcoming commentary on Ezra and Nehemiah. He has appeared in public venues such as Religion News Service, Sojourners, and Working and Preaching, and I love this one, the Freakonomics Podcast. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Yeah, I, I was on Freakonomics uh, a couple months ago. They recorded me for 90 minutes, and they took eight of those minutes. That was, that was worthy <laughs> of the podcast, so I'm very, very proud of that. Uh, good morning to you. I'm pretty sure this is my first time in Wisconsin. I think this is my first time, so thank you for the well, invitation. Yeah. You're welcome. So I was born and raised in California, and Wisconsin always had this kind of mythic vibe for us because uh, our, our two sources for understanding life in Wisconsin, the first one was this TV show called Laverne and Shirley. Uh, I remember that for some reason. Uh, that was my immigrant's family's introduction to America, which is weird, I think. Uh, the second reason is the Green Bay Packers. Was and so uh, growing up in California, if it's under 70 degrees, my mom's putting a turtleneck on me. And then I remember my earliest memory, it actually snowed in San Jose, California in 1976. I, I remember that, I was in kindergarten. And it didn't stay, but everyone was so excited. And then I turn on the TV to watch the Green Bay Packers, and it's sub-zero, there's white everywhere, and I'm, is that safe? Is that okay to be outside? <laughs> This is my first time in Wisconsin, but it is not my first time with the UMC. I grew up in the Korean United Methodist Church of Santa Clara, and I know that um, Wesleyan polity is not the most inspiring topic of a conference, uh, but to underscore that you are making impact on lived realities, on lives. Because from my family, the Korean United Methodist Church of Santa Clara was critical in our life. The immigrants from Korea came mostly after 1967 because of the release of quotas that happened in 1965 that actually didn't take effect till a few years later. And so all the elders, all the adults in my church were first generation immigrants. And the church was so much more than a place of just worship. We stayed there all day. I remember how my church smelled because they had to include a kitchen. 
in whatever, I know the UMC has gone through a lot of challenges. It continues to face a lot of challenges. The church is changing worldwide. With that said, the KUMC was critical in my life. It was the first time where I read the Bible, and it was the first time where I actually learned Korean, and it was the time where I could hear so much Korean every Sunday. And so as you think about the theme of abundant life and beloved community, for a lot of my parents' generation, the church was the only place where they can access abundant life, beloved community. It's a place where they can speak in their language of origin, a place where they can have their food without reservation, without apology. And so I'll be forever grateful to the KUMC Santa Clara for deciding in 1975 we need to plant a church in the Korean language with Korean pastors to minister to Korean people. And this church will not be just one worship sing some songs in Korean, have a sermon and go, but we're gonna make the facility so they can stay there and have a life and connect with one another. In 1984, this church hired a director of education. He, uh, the, the Korean term is chondosa, which kind of means pastoral intern. It's not quite an ordained person yet. And uh, that um, pastoral intern was uh, pastoral intern Hee Soo Jung. And so he came to our church in 1984. In 2023, Candler selected Bishop Jung to be the McDonald Chair at Candler School of Theology of Emory University. I had not seen him in almost four decades. And so uh, it was a pleasure to have him on our campus teaching intensives, giving special lectures, and visiting with local congregations, and of course, our Korean students. This morning, I want to help you reflect the theme of an abundant God and a beloved community. An abundant God. I want to interrogate what you think when I say abundant. And I'm actually gonna begin by saying two very controversial statements that I believe to be true of the Bible. The first thing is the Old Testament. Whenever it talks of blessing, almost every time, it refers to material blessing, economic blessing. The second thing is that whenever the Bible says money in the Old Testament, it actually doesn't mean money. A lot of people believe that money didn't actually exist till much later in terms of the function of money, an item of trade. Actually, a lot of people think it wasn't until the Industrial Revolution when you had true money in the way the economics, economists talk about it. And so whenever it says money in the Old Testament, it actually doesn't talk about money. It's a translation for silver, which was traded. And in a few instances, it's a translation for some sort of coin. It's mentioned two or three times in the Old Testament. So as mentioned, I was a financial analyst before becoming a biblical scholar. Uh, I was in the Silicon Valley, and uh, this was the 1990s, and so you could remember high tech in the 1990s. The Pentium chip was introduced in the mid-90s, and I was in semiconductors. And uh, I actually finished my MDiv and moved back to, I did that in Korea. I moved back to America and I wanted to take a break from ministry, so I got a job as an analyst. I had an econ degree as an undergrad. You see, in Korea, uh, at the time, you had to be 30 to be ordained, and because I had quit my Korean citizenship, I was not required to do my military service. So I graduated with my MDiv pretty early. I wasn't quite 30. And so I came back to the States, I got a job as an analyst, and did it for a few years, got married, and uh, we actually began looking for a house. And, um, you know, sometimes you make a decision by default. And so I guess I'm going to be an analyst. And we started looking for, to purchase a house. And uh, it wasn't a, a great, fun vocation for me. I did it for four years. It was a good job. It paid well. It was a great company. And um, there was a lot of potential. In the time I was there, I started in 1997 in March. And the company was at about 420 million, which is mid-sized. By the time I left, four years later, it was at 2.2 billion. And, and that was actually typical of the growth in hardware in the Silicon Valley at the time. And at the time, my wife, I was newly married, she asked me, um, she could tell that I wasn't really fulfilled as an analyst. And so she asked me, if you're guaranteed success by God in anything, in anything you want, what would you do? And I said, like, I, I think I would have been a Bible professor. I enjoyed Hebrew. I enjoyed all those Bible classes. And I, I think I would have been okay at that. And then she asked me, well, well, why don't you do that? 
And I was like, uh, okay. <laughs> and I, uh, I quit my job as a high-tech uh, Silicon Valley analyst for the lucrative position of biblical scholar. <laughs> Obviously, I'm a terrible financial analyst to make that decision. <laughs> But something happened at that time as an analyst that informed who I am as a scholar. When I was interviewing for the job, you know, it's the same thing. You, you go through these interviews. Eventually, the last interview was with the CFO on another day. I remember talking to the CFO, and he's talking about the company. And he wasn't an engineer. I wasn't an engineer, but we were in an engineering company. And he said to me during that interview, Roger, this company is run through finance. It's not run through tech. It's not run through engineering. It's run through finance. And economic concerns have a totalizing impact on the decisions of the company. And I stuck with that. And when it came time for me to write a dissertation for my PhD, I thought, I think I want to write on the ancient economies of Israel. Because I'll make assumptions on that, and they're very much intrinsic. We don't really have consciousness of those assumptions. But think about the economies of ancient Israel as you think about abundance. There was no money questions that are very fundamental to our lives today. What are you going to major in? What are you going to do for a job? Where are you going to live? Who are you going to marry? Those were not decisions of the past. Those were economic decisions done by the patriarch of your household. You did what your dad did. And when you married, you moved to your husband's house. You worked the farm like everyone else. And in terms of where you live, you live the same place because you could see this family grave, this family tomb of generations before you. So the economics we bring to a text is very different from the economics of the text. Our lives are so much different. There's a centrality of economic thought in everything, but yet we don't really think about that too much. And for one thing I want to mention is that uh, abundance means something very different if you're living in an agrarian society. So if you look at the first slide I have, you have an abundant promise to Abraham. Remember, Abraham at this moment is 99 years old. Abraham is also a migrant. We are introduced to him in Genesis 12, and God says, go. And Abraham goes, goes right away. He leaves the land. And if you look at this verse, think about the context of abundance. I will make you exceedingly fruitful and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you, and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land where you are now an alien, all the land of Canaan, for perpetual holding, for I will be their God." So God promises this to a person who has left everything. Because in the ancient world, when there's no money, when there's no way to accumulate and hoard, what are the economic assets? And there are two. There are two assets. One is land. Land is an asset because you can harvest it. And through harvesting the land, you can get some sustenance for you and your family. Land gives you a place where you can make a shelter, when you can grow your crops for yourself and sometimes for the king, as well. That is the first promise, of the first asset of the ancient world. The second asset is progeny, and we're talking about sons. Uh, my grandmother and grandfather married each other when they were 17, which was common, and it was an arranged marriage. And uh, my dad comes from a family of nine kids. He's one of nine siblings. My mom comes from a family of eight siblings, and that was typical of Korea at that time, of agrarian societies, children are an asset, specifically, we have to name it, sons, because the daughters go off to another family. In the ancient world, if you married as a middle teen, and you think about fertility for women, you also knew, and they knew this in the ancient world as well, that breastfeeding was a way to prevent immediate pregnancy again. And if you put in death through childbirth, if you put in famine, and war, and accidents, if you were to make it through life with two adult sons, you're, you're probably doing pretty well. You're probably doing too, pretty well. And so land and progeny, specifically sons, so they could work the land, take the inheritance, and, consider, and continue your family name. 
And here, Abraham has neither of those things. He presumably had land in Babylon, but God told him to leave and he left. So by leaving that, he left all that he had. And they were unfortunate at this time to not have progeny, to not have sons. And God doesn't just promise a little plot of family land. And God doesn't promise just one child or two children. He says, I will make you exceedingly fruitful. And think about the imagery. How, how is a human fruitful? It is by having children. And it'll be so fruitful that kings should come before you. And I will give to you the land where you are not an alien. You're just kind of wandering. You don't own anything. You're going from place to place to place. You're carrying all that you own and packing some on some sort of quadruped or mule or something like that. That is everything that you have. But all the land of Canaan will be for you a perpetual holding. This is a startling promise to Abraham, which is kind of a repeat but built up from Genesis 12, from Genesis 15. So God not only tells and gives this really, really unbelievable command to Abraham, but the command comes with a promise of abundance, abundance that is known in the ancient world. The economics of the ancient world is very different, so I want to show you a little bit, kind of catalyze your imagination for what economic life was like in different periods of the Old Testament. So the next slide, I have a little, um, I have a little uh, prop for you. This is called the Gezer Calendar. You can see this right now in Turkey. You can see this uh, replica in Jerusalem. And this is for, until 2005, this was the only known writing from the time of David and Solomon of the 10th century BC. Uh, it's about this big, it's written on limestone, and it's written in some sort of Hebrew, kind of a Hebrew-like language, it's Northwest Semitic. And uh, what's interesting is, um, in all of the 10th century, this is the only example until 2005, on excavation they, they discovered a second example. And it's always the college kid, it's never the professor, it's the college kid who discovers this, and it's always the last day, because the last day of excavation you're cleaning, everything, you're kind of seeing things better. And so this college kid saw this doesn't look like a scratch. And so he showed his supervisor, showed the professor, and it turned out this was the second example of writing of the 10th century. The third example was actually found in about 2012 at another site. And this is on a, what's called an ostraca. It's a, um, a pottery shard with writing and ink on there. It's actually the previous side, actually. Keep on the Gezer calendar if we could. And so what this tells us, if you have three pieces of writing in all the 10th century BC, and Israel is the most excavated land in all the world, what does it tell you about the economy? Because writing was created as an economic function, as an economic tool. The first writing wasn't this literary epic of the Bible or Gilgamesh, it was actually very mundane inventory lists. It's something like six sheep, four donkeys, you know, three uh, jars of oil, that, that was the first writing. And in fact, 99% of the routing examples are those types of documents. So what does this text tell us about the economy? So this is written in this kind of weird Hebrew. If you could read the text, two months gathering. What do you notice from that? Two months gathering, two months planting, two months late sowing, one month cutting flax, one month reaping barley, one month reaping and measuring grain, two months pruning, one month summer fruit, and abij and a dot. It's, the rest is lost, but it probably means Abijah, something like that. And that's a, a well-known name. It's actually a name of one of the kings of Judah. It means uh, Yah, Yah or Yahweh is my father. So a couple of things you'll notice. If you add up the months, you'll get to 12. This is projecting what a calendar, a good agricultural calendar will be. And if you actually count the type of products, you'll see five or six. So this is a diversified family farm, and it seems like this is something for sustenance. You're grazing crops, not so you can sell them or trade them or give them, but to feed your own family. There's some flax and some barley and grain, some pruning, which might refer to um, olives or something like that. Uh, there's fruit. Olives, by the way, it's something if you plant an olive orchard, you don't see anything for 10 years and you don't see the fullness of the produce until another generation. So planting an olive orchard is a labor of love for your children, because you will not benefit from it for your children. 
So you have all these diverse products, you have 12 months, and this is written on limestone. So limestone is actually one of the things, you can actually scratch it, it's not like marble, you could scratch it off. You can like, it's very malleable for a piece of writing. And in fact, this particular example, it's what's called a palimpsest. And so they had writing, and then they scratched it off, and then they wrote this. And you can kind of see glimpses of the previous writing on the Gezer calendar. And so why did they, what was the function of this text? So it's not an inventory list, it's some sort of planning, but it's almost like this is the perfect agricultural year for us. So the idea is with it, that someone would take and write this perfect agricultural calendar for a family, and they would do some sort of magic. They would kind of scratch off the writing in the letters and have it maybe be in some sort of ritual to hope to the gods for a perfect harvest. Because in the ancient world, if you are a farmer, you do it's so much work, but it does not depend on you. If you have no rain, you will get nothing. If you have pestilence, you will get nothing. And so one of the estimates in ancient Israel was that for every 10 years of agriculture, three of those years would yield zero harvest. Three of those, so you have to plan. If you get a good harvest, you need to store the grain for the next year. You need to store the olives for the next year. And this is one of the strategies for diversified agriculture because what happened is if you get a zero harvest in say grain and barley, at least you have livestock. Livestock that you can use and kill and use to feed your family and try to last a little bit longer and hope on faith that the next year will be better. So right away you can tell abundance is just having enough to eat this year. And faith in God, that God will provide the rains. And if the rains are withheld this year, because you know as, a, as an experienced farmer, sometimes you get zero harvest, then God will make it so you have it the following year. Of course, we know that also isn't always the case from the Joseph narrative. There could be as many as seven years of famine. But abundance is just having enough. It's not a massive retirement account or a massive house or savings and assets. Abundance is enough to take you for this year. So this was the 10th century. This was actually the time of Solomon. And it's kind of a, a humble type of economic existence. But you should know that by the Bible's own account, Israel and Judah were very small compared to Babylon and Assyria and all these great polities. It was a very small, modest polity in terms of comparative scape, scope with the others. So this was the ancient world. So let's go ahead and do the next slide and look at another time. 200 years ago. Let's go to Hezekiah and look at the Samaria Ostraca. This is another great example. In the 10th century, I said there are three examples of writing. In the 8th century, there are hundreds and hundreds of examples of writing. So right away, that tells me that writing and literacy are going to be more dominant in the 8th century. And we know that literacy arises when there is a more centralized economy. Because remember, you write for economic and accounting purposes. You don't necessarily write for writing legends and poems, although that became a function within the Bible later on. So what is a Samaria? So early in the 20th century, they're excavating Samaria, the capital of the Northern Kingdom. And pottery is everywhere, it's ubiquitous. And typically with pottery, it allows you to identify a time period because every time has a unique shape of pottery. And so you find pottery, you put it in a bowl, uh, you put it in a bin, and then you soak them for 24 hours, and then you scrub them off, and then you develop typologies. You try to reconstruct to see what the pottery looked like so you can date that particular strata. Well, what happened in this excavation is someone was like, you know, washing off the pottery, and then letters appeared. And they kind of panicked, and they went to every pottery piece of pottery found, and it turns out they found over 100 examples of writing in this pottery from the 8th century, and this is called the Samaria Ostraca. So remember the earlier example, one example from the 10th century, five or six different agricultural products. And you go to the 8th century of Hezekiah, 100 examples, in all 100 examples collectively, it mentions two products only. Maybe a third, but the two products for sure that are mentioned is something called old wine, in washed oil, and that would be the Hebrew translation. 
It's written in good Hebrew, but it's not precisely the Hebrew of the Bible because this is Samaria. It's written in northern Hebrew. And we know because the word for in, in wine in northern Hebrew has a regional difference from the Hebrew in the Bible. And it doesn't just call it oil and wine. It calls it old wine and washed oil. And if you actually excavate in the 8th century, you could see vats where they uh, processed and fermented wine. And old wine was more powerful and sweeter, and it took more production capabilities because you're fermenting it for longer. So Israel is one of those places where they have competitive advantage in growing olive trees and wine. It's, it's a good climate for growing wine. And old wine was the best wine. It was the most alcoholic, had the most sugars, and it cost the most production facility to make. And so the old wine wasn't just wine, it was a special wine. And uh, the oil is not just oil, it's washed oil. And if you can do like a very casual translation, it would be like extra virgin, ol virgin olive oil. Very nice. So what, they hap what happened at the time was before the 8th century, you know how you make olive oil is you just make it for your family, for your probably two sons and their family. So like a family, a household of about 10. You would take a bunch of olives and you would crush it by hand. And then you'd be able to skim the olive oil and use it for consumption. In the 8th century, they had a different method. They had big vats, almost these factories where you put in all these olives and they'd have millstones where they would crush the olives, they'd pour in water, and they would skim the top. The very top was the washed oil. And from then on, you extract lesser quality olive oil. So back in the 10th century, you, you do it like this, right? You make olive oil. Well, in the 8th century, they found one site in a place called Tel Mikne, which is biblical Ekron. And in this site, after excavating 3% of the Tel, they found over 100 examples of these big olive oil vats. And so what that tells us, they're clearly making olive oil, not for local consumption, but for some sort of exchange. So the 10th century, a very subsistence type agriculture. The 8th century, very specialized agriculture. And if you read the Samaria Ostraca, these are delivery receipts of giving small quantities of this very nice wine and this very nice olive oil to people. And we know the site names. These people surround Samaria. So this is a way for someone to uh, presumably get some sort of political favor from warlords and chieftains around Samaria. This was some sort of exchange gift to get some sort of benefit in reciprocity. This actually fits kind of well if you look at the northern prophets. Remember, Samaria is in the north. And think about the book of Hosea. Think about the book of Amos. What's really weird about Amos, Amos doesn't mention idolatry, but he is a prophet. But his idolatry was economic injustice. And so what used to be family subsistence farms where you could feed yourself, they're turning that into places to make high quantities of wine and high quantities of olive oil to send to other people, not yourself. So there's a degree of economic injustice happening in the taking over of this land. Isaiah talks about this as well, about taking over households and making them into walls. You have a very centralized economy here in the 8th century. So that's the 8th century. Let's look at the 6th century, the next slide, in something called the Behistun inscription. In Western Iran, you have this beautiful inscription. It is uh, done by probably Darius I. And so either in the late 6th century or the early of the first half of the 5th century. And this is a well-known inscription because there are examples everywhere. We actually have this in papyrus in different places of the Persian Empire. And this is written in three languages. So this is a huge inscription. It's about 15 meters tall, 25 meters wide, and it's written in the language of Old Persian, Elamite, and Babylonian. And, and this inscription was actually critical for deciphering cuneiform, Babylonian language. So it's just like the Rosetta Stone, uh, except this is the inscription done within a mountain, and so, uh, which means uh, the British Museum can't take it. <laughs> it's on the mountain. So, you know, that's what I mean. Uh, so what's interesting about this inscription is it's huge, 15 by 25 meters, but it's 100 meters up the cliff. So you actually can't read this from the ground. You can see the beautiful sculpture, you can see the visual figures, uh, but you can't read. It's meant to kind of give awe 
to the, the people, the commoners. And so if you actually read and study this inscription, it talks a lot about how great Darius is. So it's political propaganda. It's meant to legitimize his throne. It justifies all the violence he does to create this kingdom. It talks about his loyalty that he will give to you if you are loyal to him. And it talks about if you rebel against him, he will punish you. It talks about all the wars that he's won, and it kind of throws shade on the Babylonians. It kind of makes fun of the Babylonians who he conquered, saying they are not legitimate rulers, but I am the legitimate ruler, very much justifying his existence. But remember, this is political propaganda. What it does not talk about is taxation. And we know from other documents, mainly a Greek historian named Herodotus, who talks about Darius taking and innovating the most complex taxation system known to humans. And so he had a deeply extractive empire. If you go to New York, you could see a replica of something called the Cyrus Cylinder. And this is the first Persian king who said, I'm going to take all you exiles, including the Judeans, and I'm going to take you all back to your country of origin. It, it is put in the United Nations as an example of goodwill in international diplomacy. But what scholars later discovered is Cyrus was actually not really interested in the goodwill of these migrants. He was interested in creating an empire for himself, and he decided that if he sends people back, you could extract from them. You could take all from their land and force them. And, you, and the Persians developed a system, Darius developed a system, to extract up to the limit until where they would rebel or die. It was a deeply oppressive empire. And the Bible actually refers to this. If you look at Ezra and Nehemiah, there is talk about three different types of taxes in Ezra 4.13. It talks about, there are different translations, but basically there's a tribute tax, a, a toll tax, and a poll tax, meaning every person needs to put this in every year. So multiple taxations, that was a way to get a little bit more. If you look at Nehemiah 5.4, there's something called the king's tax. And it's so oppressive that they are selling their children to be enslaved because the tax is so overwhelming. In fact, in Nehemiah 5, it says the special notation, our daughters will be ravished because in a time of economic precarity, the daughters will have the worst circumstances more than the sons. And it makes a note of that in Nehemiah 5. So what does this tell us about the economy? That it was extractive to the point of breaking. And we also know that it was a return migration. In archaeology, the land was devastated. It was not populated. You don't see the big buildings you see in the 8th century, the time before exile. But it was a very difficult economy. So if you look at the, look at the next slide, it's kind of a summary of what abundance might look like in the Old Testament. There were very different economies. They were agrarian. They were communal. So this whole idea of how much money you have is kind of a weird question because it's more how much wealth does your household have? You did not make individual financial decisions. The patriarch of your family did that. Economy was also socially embedded. And by what I mean that there wasn't kind of capitalistic exchange at a large measure. Maybe at a small measure there was. Uh, but most exchange was do done because of social networks. You lived close to your tribe. So most of the people you interacted with were family or distant cousins, and you just feed the family. When you harvest, you just share with the family. It's, it's not a decision. You're not calculating maximal utility. It is not capitalist. There may be some transactions, but by and large, it's not capitalist. Remember the exchange between Solomon and the Queen of Sheba when there are some riddles and Solomon exchanges that and, and the queen goes, oh my goodness, this is amazing. Let me give you all these things. And Solomon gives her back. So the reason for that exchange is not to maximize utility or make profit. It's to create some sort of social relationship between the Queen of Sheba and King Solomon. There's no evidence of negotiating for price, which is a hallmark of capitalism. It's just doing a social exchange. There is some limited capitalist exchange. You'll see in 1 Kings, there's a widow who suddenly gets all this olive oil 
because, um, as a gift from the prophet because her children are going to be sold into debt slavery. She's told to go to the market and sell, these oil, sell this oil to free her children. What's interesting is she is a widow, and so she does not have a social network, so she cannot get goods. So the idea that this non-attached widow in Samaria can go and sell it, so there's probably some limited markets at the time. But by and large, these are socially embedded exchanges. So what that means is, um, so I play this game with undergrads, and uh, this, you, you might have played this yourself if you study anthropology, but it's called the equilibrium game. And so this is a very simple game. I take two students, and I give one student $10. And that student A with $10 can decide how much of that $10 they could give to student B. And the student B can accept it or reject it, and the game is over. So how much do you think student A gives to student B? Almost every time, they give $5 because it's in front of everybody and they don't want to look bad, right? Never has the student taken all the money, although capitalism would say, you're going to take all $10. And so it's a socially embedded exchange. You are making a decision not just on profit maximization, but based on social standing. So there was a time where economic exchange was not tied to profit and hoarding, but towards the social life there was within. So agrarian, communal, socially embedded, non-capitalistic. In this case, abundance is different. There is no technology to store wealth in the degree that we have today or even 200 years ago, or even during the time of Jesus. And so abundance is having enough to eat right now for your family and for this year a very different notion of what you might consider abundance today. So consider that as you look back on Genesis 17 and that abundant promise to Abraham. This verse, if you show the slide, means something different if you think about abundance. I will make you exceedingly fruitful enough. I will give you enough. I will make nations of you and kings shall come from you. And I'm going to go more than enough for you, Abraham. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you your offspring after you the land which you are now an alien. This will all be yours. All the land of Canaan for perpetual holding for I will be their God. So something here in this abundant, in this passage, in this promise is the mention of covenant. And remember, Abraham has listened to God for a long time at this moment. God told Abraham to go, and Abraham listened. Abraham was now 99, and the center of this provision of abundance was the everlasting co covenant. I will be your God. In fact, before this, right before this verse, God says, I am God Almighty. I am El Shaddai. El Shaddai is one of those names of God. It appears a little less than 50 times in the Bible. It kind of emphasizes God's power and sovereignty, and sometimes his sovereignty when it doesn't seem like things will go the way that God promises. So where does God, El Shaddai appear most in the Old Testament? The book of Job, and also here in Genesis 17. That's the God of El Shaddai, the God of the mountains, who is all-powerful all and all-sovereign. Remember, some, Abraham's not perfect. In Genesis 15, 2, he says, O oh Lord God, what will you give me for I continue childless? And the gift of God of abundance is in this covenantal relationship. Later on, in verse 10, Genesis 17, 10, every male among you shall be circumcised. In verse 23, he circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that very day as God had said to them. So abundance, that which you need within this covenantal relationship with God. This image of Abraham is so powerful, and it's been so helpful through Christian and Jewish traditions over many centuries. In fact, even within the Bible itself, you see a lot of callbacks to the life of Abraham. And the next slide has Isaiah 51, one later, later community reflecting on the life of Abraham. Look to Abraham, your father. Maybe a 
better translation might be ancestor, that which has gone before you, and to Sarah who bore you. For he was but one when I called him, but I blessed him and made him many. For the Lord will comfort Zion, he will comfort all her waste places, and will make her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving in the voice of song. This is spectacular because Isaiah 51, people are interpreting that this is heard by a community that is impoverished, that does not know abundance, that does not even know that daily offering and assurance of sustenance for your family. And Isaiah is saying, look, look back to Abraham's life and look around you for all that I gave to him. Look at the blessing, even though he left his land and he was 99, look at the blessing that I gave to him. And for that will be your comfort. I love the book of Isaiah from chapter 40. Isaiah 1 through 39, first of all, it's actually really hard Hebrew. It's also like, it's pretty mean, I think. Isaiah's kind of mean. But Isaiah 40 just starts a different tenor, comfort, comfort my people. And it's speaking to a group that's impoverished, that's deeply in need, and promising them abundance. And to table your abundance doesn't mean maybe what you think it means in 2024. But for this community, when they had nothing, when they're living in wilderness, abundance maybe just had enough to eat for you and your family on faith of God through a covenantal relationship. So abundance in the Old Testament, a different meaning. Abundance in the New Testament, something very different. And like an episode of Laverne and Shirley, I will tell you that next time. So I will see you that (laughs) tomorrow morning. Thank you.